Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Um, the, uh, the title of this talk is uh, The Psychology of Game Design. Uh, everything you know is wrong. Um, I was going to call it, you know, um, people are funny, gamers are goofy, uh, it's all in your head, or everything you know is uh, questionable. But I thought everything you know is wrong, um, kind of get the juices flowing, maybe get a little more interaction. Um, the, uh, the premise of this talk is that, um, is there any way to get the slides up in the back of the, uh, back of the hall? Um, is that game play, game design, uh, is a psychological experience. Game play is a psychological experience. Um, when I design a game, a lot of my games are based on uh, historical topics, uh, the history of civilization, railroads, pirates. And the, and the way I would generally approach those topics is, you know, make it realistic, make it true, make it about, uh, you know, the more historical uh, I can make the game, the better it would be, the more railroady the game is, the better, the more piratey it is, the better. Um, and what I found in, in taking that approach was that a lot of what I thought I knew was wrong. And um, the reason was because I really hadn't uh, taken into account what really happens in the player's head. And once uh, that became an important part of kind of my design process, uh, things started to become a lot clearer. So um, the premise here is that uh, by acknowledging that the, the game, game play is really a, a psychological experience, we can um, uh, save us, ourselves a lot of time in certain areas. It makes certain parts of the process um, easier. It makes other parts of the process more difficult. But at the end of the day, I think we, we end up with, with a better game. Um, in the process, as we, as we kind of ex, ex, uh, explore this idea, we're going to kind of run into a few psychological concepts. Um, egomania is one of them we'll have to uh, explore. Basically, if you play Civilization, you are an egomaniac. I mean, it, it says right on the box, you know, build a civilization to stand the test of time. And you're there like, oh yeah, I can do that. I can do that. No problem. <laughs> so you are an egomaniac. Okay. Uh, we'll also be uh, looking into uh, paranoia, uh, delusion, and um, self-destructive behavior. This is ways that players actually kind of make the game less fun for themselves. Things they do to, to, um, to kind of detract from the fun of the game and, and ways that as a designer we can uh, try and minimize those, uh, preempt those, and, and, and try and prevent that from happening. So those are some of the things we'll be looking at uh, in the course of this uh, talk. So the first area where psychology really kind of plays an important role in, in, in game design um, it's something I call the, the winner paradox. Um, in real life, you don't always win. There are, um, what, 28 teams in the National Football League, and only one of them gets to win the Super Bowl. Um, there are 25 teams in the NBA. Uh, you know, they all go to the playoffs, I guess, but um, at the end of the day, there's only one team that gets to hold the golden trophy of NBA championness or whatever, whatever that is. So in, in the real world, um, win, the winner, you don't always win. Um, however, in the world of games, you pretty much always win. Um, and the, the psychological phenomenon is that the player doesn't really complain about that, doesn't object. That's not a problem. I don't get letters saying, you know, dear Sid, I loved your game, but I won way too much. Um, and this is actually true of other forms of, of entertainment. Uh, you know, Rambo, you know, at the end of the movie, he's going to come out all right. Uh, Sherlock Holmes always solves the mystery by the end of the, of, uh, of, of, the, of the chapter. So I think this is kind of fundamental to entertainment, but it's certainly something that, that we're aware of um, in designing video games, that the player um, uh, we're looking, the player's looking for a satisfactory conclusion. That might not always uh, include winning, but, but very often it does. Um, and this idea of kind of a satisfactory conclusion to the game, I think, is, is something to really keep in mind uh, in, in the design process. Um, some of the tools that we have at our disposal to, to create this journey for the player through the game, um, re reward and, and punishment, in other words, you know, good things happening to the player, not so good things happening to the player, 
there's an interesting dichotomy in how these are, are deployed in games. Um, when you reward the player, um, you know, you discovered uh, this cool place on the map, here's 100 gold. Um, the player, you know, gladly accepts that, doesn't question, you know, did I, did I really earn that? Is, do I deserve that? Uh, players are, are very much inclined to, to accept anything you give them uh, gladly and feel it was their own um, clever play, their own uh, incredible strategy that earned them that, that cool reward. On the other hand, um, if something bad happens to the player, your game is broken, there's something horribly wrong, the game is cheating, uh, it's, it's really important to, uh, to be very careful with the setbacks that the player experiences in the game. It's important that the player understand why those things happened, and especially how to prevent that from happening uh, the next time. Uh, and and any time you can kind of plant that seed of the next time in the player's head, you're, you're well on your way to this idea of replayability, that the player's going to play again. Next time I'm going to try something different, maybe that might not happen. So uh, a big part of the value of, of, of these games is in their replayability. So any opportunity that you have to uh, plant the seed of replayability, I think, is, is, is important. And by really carefully handling the idea of punishment and setbacks, where, where you explain what, why it happened and how it, how it can be prevented the next time, uh, that's very important. Um, in terms of rewards, another key thing that, that we think about is the first 15 minutes. One of our rules of game design is that the first 15 minutes have to be uh, really compelling, really fun, a, a, a kind of almost a foreshadowing of all the cool stuff that's going to happen later in the game. And these rewards are really a way of, of uh, making the player feel comfortable in this world, uh, letting them know that they're on the right track, they're, you know, they're, they're on their way, Cool stuff is happening, and even cooler stuff is going to be happening later on. And these uh, early rewards, you can almost not reward the player enough in the, in the very early stages of the game to kind of get them invested, get them committed, get them to be uh, part of the world that you're creating. Um, now, this doesn't negate the value of difficulty levels. Uh, I'm not adv advocating uh, an elastic uh, difficulty that kind of always uh, pushes the player forward and never provides any challenges. Um, uh, a number of years ago, um, I gave a talk on, on difficulty levels and, and was very convincingly uh, made the point that four difficulty levels were the perfect number of difficulty levels. There needed to be one for um, introducing the player to the game where the, where the player could basically always win, one for the casual player, one for the, uh, the player who's really experienced, and then the fourth difficulty level which would be the ultimate challenge. Uh, I was wrong about that. Um, apparently, we need uh, nine difficulty levels. The latest Civilization IV has uh, nine difficulty levels. And it really points out how um, this, this idea of progress and advancement uh, is, is so rewarding for the player. The reason we have these difficulty levels is to give the player this feeling that there's always another challenge out there, that they've mastered this level, they're ready to move on to the to the next uh, level. And that's another reward, is this idea of, uh, of, of getting to the next level in the game. Um, so you want your player to feel that they are above, above average. They're doing well, and they're going to do even better as they go deeper into the game. I think that, um, again, if you kind of follow the first 15-minute rule, it's very important that um, you kind of start the player off with a very positive uh, experience. Uh, the unholy alliance. Uh, this is a concept that I want to trademark. I think this is a really cool idea. I missed out on the uncanny valley, um, and I never trademarked interesting decisions. But uh, unholy alliance, I think, is a is a concept that, um, in many ways, uh, defines the relationship between the player and the designer. Um, the the unholy alliance is an agreement that the player and the designer make with each other. I'm going to pretend certain things, you're going to pretend certain things, and together we'll have a great experience. Um, so one of the things that, that we, present, we pretend as designers is that the player is, is good. You're really good. That's, that's kind of a, um, a, a mantra from us that we want the player to feel good about the play experience and, and themselves as they're playing. 
And one example, um, perhaps, of where this kind of went off the tracks is in the the, the history of flight simulators going back a, a number of years. Uh, early on, they were um, kind of easy to play, uh, very accessible. You'd shoot down a lot of planes, you'd have a lot of fun. Um, and then we got to where every succeeding iteration of flight simulators became a little more realistic, a little more complex, a little more of a simulation. And, um, and pretty soon the player went from, I'm good, to I'm not good, I'm, I'm confused, I'm, I'm, my plane is on flat fire and I'm falling out of the sky, and, and the fun kind of went out of them. And I think we have to uh, be, be, be aware of this phenomenon that um, uh, it's all about the player. The player is the star of, of the game. Uh, their experience is what's key, what's, uh, what's critical, and keeping them feeling good about themselves is, is certainly a, a, an important part of the experience that we provide for them. Um, another part of this unholy alliance is the player's role. The player really needs to be willing to suspend uh, their disbelief. They need to inhabit that character. They need to take on that, that role that you're providing them, whether it's a king of a great civilization or managing a railroad or being a cool pirate. Uh, the player has to uh, be willing to suspend their disbelief. That's part uh, they're part of the, of the, of the bargain. Um, when, uh, when we go to a movie, my, my, my wife, uh, you know, I ask her after we've seen a movie, you know, how did you like the movie? A lot of times she'll say, well, you know, I came out of that movie twice, or I never got into that movie, or I never came out of the movie. Um, very aware of the, the value of suspending your disbelief to, to, uh, to enjoy the experience or to make it uh, more compelling. So, so part of our job is to help the player to, to suspend their disbelief. Um, and I think in some ways, uh, those of us that are old time designers have a little bit of an advantage there in that we, we worked in the good old days of, of 16 color graphics and things like that where we really had to work hard to, uh, to get the player to believe that what was happening on the screen was uh, the management of a great empire or, 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 or building uh, a railroad system or things like that. So. Um, I think, I think having that experience was helpful in really understanding uh, some of the challenges of, of getting the player to suspend their, their disbelief. Um, one of the other agreements that we make, I think, in, in this unholy alliance with the player is um, the, the idea of moral clarity. And let, let me give you an example. Uh, here's a, a screenshot from uh, a Civilization Revolution where we're negotiating with, with the great Genghis Khan. Um, and one of the comments that I got back from, from, from playtesters was, um, these leaders um, you know, are very kind of cranky and aggressive. You know, I'm, I might be winning the battle against them, they might be down to their last city, and they're still kind of up there saying, you know, hey, you know, you're, you'll never take me down, I'm the greatest civilization of all time, you know, come on, attack me, I, I dare you. you know? and, they, and they said, well, you know, that just doesn't seem seem right. They should they, they shouldn't have that attitude if I'm if I'm winning. And and my, my question was, well, you know, what what would you like them to say? Do you want them to say, Oh, you know, please don't hurt me. We have only one city left and there's women and children there and you know, please leave me alone. Um, to me that's like a moral dilemma, you know. I mean I want to win, I want to capture their city. It's Genghis Khan for goodness sake. Um, but I'm faced with a moral moral dilemma. Um, I think it's more satisfying, and, and, we, and that's something we discovered, it's more satisfying to win against um, bad Genghis, cranky Genghis, um, than it is if, if you know, there was some kind of a, a moral cloud over the actions that, that you were taking. Um, MAD is a concept called uh, mutually assured destruction. Um, how many of you rem remember the Cold War? Let's hear it for the Cold War, okay. Uh, uh, the idea of mutually assured destruction was that, you know, we had all these nuclear weapons and the Russians had all these nuclear weapons and we could just blow each other up anytime we wanted to, but the reason we didn't was because we knew the other side had all these uh, nuclear weapons. And 
there's an amazing parallel to that in, in uh, the relationship between uh, game designers and the player. Um, the player can actually destroy the experience at any time they want to. They can quit the game, they can uh, you know, play in a way, in a different way, they can, they can cheat, they can do all sorts of stuff to kind of destroy the experience. And uh, as a game designer, we can, we can uh, mess up the game as well. I mean, we, we can kind of lose the thread of the fantasy. There was a game that we were working on at Microprose uh, many years ago that kind of illustrated this to me. It was an adventure game, and, and basically, um, you kind of started at, at the beginning of the road, and you adventured your way on down until you got to the castle, and you know, finally uh, got to see the king, and, and, and had gone through this great adventure. And when you got to the king, all of a sudden it was revealed to you that the king who you thought was a good guy is actually a bad guy and, and everything was turned around and you had to go back down the path you just uh, come to back to the beginning to do the real thing that you were supposed to do in the first place. So um, to me that was um, us messing up the game. I mean basically you know I can imagine the design meetings you know imagine the look on the player's face when they realize that all this work they've done has to be was in vain, and the surprise, and the, the, you know, the amazing design, you know, they'll, they'll think, what an amazing design to surprise me like that. I said, no, that's not what they're going to think. They're going to think, I just wasted eight hours on this stupid game, and so they would, at that point, they would mutually, assuredly destruct the game, I believe, and, and so there are ways, I think, again, that, that, that we need to be careful that we're true to um, the, the, the story of the game and, 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 and value the players. Uh, time. Another part of this alliance I think that we make with players is in the area of, um, of style. Uh, things that convey uh, what, what the spirit of your game is. You know, what, what's, if, if you start the game off and it's kind of, you know, have kind of a lighthearted uh, music, uh, atmosphere, cartoony graphics, you know, and all of a sudden people's heads start exploding, then you, you, you haven't uh, you haven't lived up to the alliance. You, you, you know, you're, you're, you're not giving the player what you promised them. You know, on, on the other hand, if you, um, you know, if you have dark, foreboding graph, uh, sound and music, and, and and ends up being a very simple game, again, you 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 you, you kind of are, are fooling the player. And uh, you know, if if, if I'm if, if I'm playing a game that starts off light and happy and and and. Uh, and and cartoony, and all of a sudden, you know, terrible things start to happen. You know, that's that's when the player, uh, you know, loses their suspension of disbelief um, and turns off your game and, and moves on. So I think um, the 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 only way to kind of uh, maintain the suspension of disbelief, which is critical to keeping the player in the game, is to really um, uh, make that a priority and, and and use things like humor, style, music, atmosphere, all these all these tools. To, uh, to, to be consistent and, and keep the player in, in your world. So probably where it became most clear to me that um, uh, player psychology has absolutely nothing to do with rational thought was um, in the process of putting together the battle system in, in Civilization Revolution. Um, my background is in mathematics and science and programming and I think of myself as a logical person. Um, and what we did in Civ uh, Revolution was we would show you before a battle what the, uh, what the odds were. Uh, in this example, um, our attacker here has a, a 1.5, and the, uh, the defender, the barbarians, have a, a 0 0.5. Um, they, they would have a 1. The barbarians are basically 1. But since they're uncivilized, they take a 50% penalty for that. So they're only 0 0.5. And part of, the, part of the fun of being a designer is kind of throwing those little things into the game, you know, uncivilized, minus 50%. <sighs> Take that. Uh, so in this case, as a mathematician, this would be a 3 to 1 battle, 1 1.5 to, to, to 2.5. You know, 3 to 1, the attacker should win three times. The, the defender should win one time out of four. Uh, very clear, very simple, you know, that's what mathematics says, that's the way it should work. Uh, that's not the way our players saw it. Um, basically, at a certain point, players feel they are going to win the battle. And um, they would come to me and said, you know, I had this battle, it was three to one, and I lost. 
It's like, well, yeah, you know, three to one. Uh, you're going to lose every once in a while. I said, no, no, you don't understand. It was three to one. Three, three's big. One is small. I, I had the big number. I sh- you know, shouldn't I, shouldn't I have won? So I realized, okay, there's something going on here. Um, so we adjusted our system um, by actually breaking the battle up into kind of more atomic little battles to make the, the results come out more uh, than the player expected. Um, and then I watched some more players playing, and um, this time the player had, had won against three. The player had won, the little tiny one, and the, the, the AI had the big gigantic three. Um, and I watched, and, and lo and behold, the player won the battle. And I said, doesn't that feel wrong to you? That, that, that you with your little tiny one won against the huge three? And they said, no, doesn't feel wrong at all. Uh, I had, you know, clever tactics and strategy, clean living, it, it all adds up to me winning. Uh, so we realized that something was going on there psychologically that, that isn't exactly mathematics. I'm not sure what it is, but it's not mathematics. So we made a few adjustments and I said, okay, now, now are you happy with uh, the way combat works? And we found that th- there is this point, and it's a, kind of around three to one, four to one, where people do expect to pretty much win every time. So, so, so okay, we said, okay, that's fine. We can, we can live with that. Um, anything else, you know? Um, they said, well, there's just one little thing. Um, I'm okay, you know, I, here's a two to one battle. Are you okay with you know, winning most of the time, but every now and then losing a two to one? The player said, yeah, 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 I, you know, I, two to one, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that, two to one. I, I, should, I should win most of the time, but every now and then I can lose. So, okay, good. Um, So what's your problem? Well, I had this 20 to 10 battle, and I lost. It was 20 to 10. I said, yeah. 20 to 10. I had 10 more than the 10. I had 20. But isn't that, I said, you know, isn't that 2 to 1, 20 to 10? No, that's 20 to 10. (laughs) That's a whole different different odds than 2 to 1. Okay. So we... um, we actually adjusted, you know, okay, that I can see you have 10 more, so that's a lot. Okay, cool. Okay, so now, you know, we made the adjustment, gave the game back. Now are you happy? Well, kind of, but let me tell you what happened. I had this two-to-one battle, and I lost, which is okay. You know, we've had this discussion. I understand now that every now and then I'm going to lose a two-to-one battle. But right after that, I had another two-to-one battle, and I lost again. How can that be? (laughs) How how can I lose two two two-to-one battles? I mean, one, I can understand. The computer's out to get me, obviously. Um, Okay, so we actually take into account the results of previous battles uh, now when we do our our combat calculations. And um, then the player was very happy. Um, and, the, and we don't really do this just to make the player happy, but it's really uh, um, when, when something happens in a battle like this that, that feels wrong, we, we start to lose that suspension of disbelief. The player comes out of the game and, um, and starts to you know, uh, pay attention to other things that are going on, as, uh, not within the game. So it's all a part of the process of, of really trying to maintain the suspension of disbelief as the player is playing the game. And uh, something really kind of uh, clear and instructive about this process, I think, you know, the interaction between logic and science and math and psychology uh, kind of really became clear to me in this process. And, you know, I think it, 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 it all makes sense, but it's, it's very uh, counterintuitive. And I think one of the things about um, really including the psychological part of things in, in, in game thinking and design is it's going to run into a number of counter, counter, in, counterintuitive things. And we'll see a little more of that later, but um, there, there are many times when that actually can work to your advantage. Uh, and it's not always uh, quite the process that we just uh, went through. Um, so this part is called my, my bad. Uh, times when I really screwed up and kind of came to realize that it was because 
my brain was too logical and scientific and I hadn't really included a lot of the psychological aspects of uh, what goes on in, in games. Um, the first bad, bad thing I did in life was uh, to make uh, Civilization a real-time game. The original prototype of, of Civilization was real-time. Uh, kind of inspired by uh, SimCity and that genre of games where you're kind of watching something grow. Um, you know, SimCity, I think, inspired a lot of designers to, to, to branch out uh, in, in kind of construction-oriented games, growth games. Um, but what we found with the, uh, the real-time version of, of Civilization was that the, um, the player really uh, became an observer, uh, was, was watching what's going on, was, was really um, d just an observer. And the, kind of the, the mantra that we had in mind for, for Civilization was, it's good to be king. Um, and we found that, that when we made it a turn-based game, all of a sudden, you know, lights went off. Uh, all of a sudden, the player was no longer an observer. They were the, the, the star of the game. They were the, the key, uh, key ingredient, and, the, and they made things happen. Um, kind of ironic, since Civ is now the poster child for, for turn-based gaming, but uh, Civ uh, star actually started off as a real-time game, and that was, my, that was my bad. Sorry about that. Um, another uh, bad thing that I did um, in the original Civilization design was to uh, include this idea of rise and fall. Um, you know, wouldn't it be cool if you built this uh, cool civilization and then, you know, you had this kind of setback and it started to crumble, you know, and just before it disappeared, you rescued it and you came back to win even more strong and powerfully than you did before. You know, wouldn't that be an awesome experience? Um, no. It, uh, not really. What we found was that, that just at, the, at the, the cusp of the crumble, most players would reload a save game, and they would never experience the, the glorious re-rise that we had uh, in mind for them. So uh, Civilization is basically um, a, a game about progress. It's a game about rise, rise, and more rise, uh, um, and not so much the fall. Um, another badness that I perpetrated um, was in the original Civilization tech tree. Um, the idea that I had in mind was that technology would be this um, interesting path of kind of discovery through the darkness, and you would kind of never know where the different paths of technology would lead. Uh, you know, it seemed to me totally wacky that um, you would be thinking, you know, back in 3000 BC, okay, if I discover iron working, you know, someday I'm going to have gunpowder and nuclear weapons. You know, um, so we randomized the tech tree. We did a lot of things to make that process uh, kind of mysterious. Uh, but once players realized, you know, generally the second time they played, that there was gunpowder out there, their only goal was, you know, how do I get to gunpowder most quickly? You know, give me, give me the, uh, the road. You know, don't randomize, don't, don't mysterious size this thing. I know there's gunpowder out there. You know, you can't fool me. Um, and we, we understood that players want to be in control. They really want to know what's going on. And um, the kind of broader lesson from this for me was that uh, any, any kind of randomness really needs to be treated with a lot of care. Um, we also had the idea in the original civilization of these kind of great natural disasters. You know, wouldn't it be cool to have like volcano Krakatoa blowing up or the, uh, the plague and all these kind of famous world events happening in the game, um, you know, kind of randomly. Um, no, it wouldn't. Um, again, whenever anything random happens to the player, um, paranoia strikes in. Paranoia was one of our early um, uh, psychological feelings. Uh, the, the player feels that the, the computer did that, rolled that random number just to make their life more difficult or they were just about to win. Um, so, random events have to be treated very, very carefully uh, because if they're significant, um, uh, basically the player will find the worst and, 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 and most paranoid explanation for what just happened in the game. Uh, randomness at a, at a low level certainly uh, helps a lot to uh, variety, replayability, things like that, but really need to be careful with randomness um, at, a, at a really significant uh, level. Um, the, um, I'm going to skip the covert action rule. That's kind of boring. Um, 
the, the Dinos game was another mistake that I made. Um, a while back, I, I gave a talk called uh, you know, Dinosaurs, The Three Glorious Failures. Um, basically, that was a game that I thought would be very cool, tried to create. I uh, did three different versions. One was a, a RTS type game, one was more of a strategy game, one was actually a card game. Um, and none of them really kind of gelled together. And, and, and I was disappointed. I, mean, I thought dinosaurs are very cool and we ought to may be able to make a, a cool game about this. But it, it never really uh, came together for reasons I, I'm not quite sure of yet. But um, what's, what's interesting to me, though, is that. After Civilization, that's almost the best known game. Of, when I talk to people, when I run into people, you know, besides Civilization, the, the other question is, where's the Dino game, you know? So, this game that I never made is like the second most interesting game for, for, for gamers. So, um, that was my bad, but I'll, um, oh, life is not over yet. Um, and Civilization Network. This is a new game that we're working on. Uh, Civilization for the Facebook platform. Um, a lot of kind of fun game concepts that, that we get to play with here. Uh, you know, uh, people playing on kind of an interesting schedule. You know, maybe a, a little bit of time a day, a little more time a day. Uh, kind of making uh, the game interesting if you're playing at the same time as other players or if you're playing at different times as other players. Uh, the idea that you're playing with friends so that, you won't, that uh, we can really focus a lot on cooperative gameplay, also include competitive gameplay, individual gameplay, all different kinds of gameplay mixed together. So this is really kind of a fun, uh, fun world to take civilization into. And one of the ideas that we, that we played with here was uh, the idea of being able to give gold to other players. You know, it was like, wouldn't it be neat, wouldn't this rather kind of lead to all sorts of interesting uh, possibilities if we, if we put into the game the, the, the ability to give gold to other players. You could say, you know, I'll give you this much gold if you do this for me, or, you know, I feel sorry for you, uh, you know, I'm going to give you 300 gold, um, or, you know, hey, please give me some gold, you know, whatever. Um, there would be this fascinating uh, kind of diplo diplomatic negotiating dynamic that would, that would uh, arise in the game. Um, what we found, however, was that nobody ever gave gold to anybody else. No, just it, the thought did not cross their mind to give gold to other people. Um, I don't know what this says about the human condition or the future of mankind, but it's, it's kind of a sad, sad commentary, I think. Uh, another, another bad idea that, that, that I had. Okay, one of the things that I, I kind of uh, promised in the, uh, the blurb to this presentation was to explain how to uh, make, uh, save millions of dollars in, in, in game design. And uh, so if you're interested in that part of the presentation, this would be the time to pay attention. Um, one of the techniques I think that's very, very uh, important in making AAA games on a, on a shoestring is to really use the player's imagination as, as a very key tool. Um, no matter how good your graphics are, no matter how cool your technology is, what's happening in the player's mind, the player can always visualize something uh, more compelling, more dynamic. Uh, so, so the goal of, of everything we do is to make something happen in the player's imagination that is, uh, that is really cool. And, and often, we don't have to literally uh, show everything in the game to make that happen. If, if the player can imagine what's going on, you know, imagine what Napoleon is doing when he's not actually on the screen. Uh, imagine what's going on behind the scenes, then uh, we save uh, a lot of money by not having to create all those assets and do all those things. And one example, again, from uh, Civilization Revolution is, uh, is this screen here. Um, it says, foreign rulers seek your favor. The Sultan of Zanzibar sends you a caravan of exotic gifts, including seven dancing bears. The, the principle here is something I call go with the flow. In other words, um, if it's something the player is already inclined to believe, if it's something the player there wants to believe, it's very easy to make that happen in the, in the player's imagination. The player looks at this and says, oh, oh yeah, foreign, foreign leaders should be seeking my favor. Um, and, uh, you know, exotic gifts, cool. You know, they should be sending me, and, and seven, you know, dancing bears, that's, that's very cool. So it's, it's happening, you know, in your mind, the bears are dancing, it's all happening up there. 
uh, because you know I'm kind of inclined to agree with this sentiment right here, and、um, we actually don't have any dancing bears. There, there's no real, there's no Sultan of Zanzibar. There's no caravan, but. By going with the flow, we've saved ourselves millions of dollars in not having to create all these models and textures and assets and all this kind of stuff,、uh, because the player is going to is going to wants to believe this. And、um, all we have done is basically put up、uh, a text box. Now that allows us to save our 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 resources, our time, our energy for the things that are that are kind of harder to sell, the things that the player might not be so inclined to believe or or kind of want to see. Uh, brought to, to 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 life with all sorts of cool graphical stuff.、Um, another technique for saving millions and millions of dollars in、uh, designing games is to to use、uh, take advantage of what the player already knows.、Um, players bring lots of their own information to games, and they don't have to.、Uh, a lot of that doesn't have to be reinforced、uh, literally. Pir- you know, pirates, for example. A game where、uh, people bring a lot of、um, of their own knowledge to the game. So if you know they see a a swordsman with a black curly mustache, you know they probably know that that's going to be the evil、uh, meta villain that they're going to have to sword fight. And 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 we don't need a whole lot of backstory you know, to explain you know how he got that way and what his childhood was like, et cetera, et cetera.、Uh, black curly mustache, you know, okay, bad guy. Time for a sword fight.、Um, millions of dollars saved in backstory.、Um, so these are just a couple of techniques by which、um, you can kind of focus, I think, your energy and your resources on、uh, what's going to be really impressive, what's going to be new, and what's going to be hard to sell in the game, and, and, and take advantage of, of, of things that the players kind of going to almost automatically provide、uh, through their own、uh, imagination. Let's talk about artificial intelligence、uh, for a moment.、Um, AI is often a place where psychology really comes strongly into into play, because、um, the AI kind of represents your opponent, the enemy. And whenever you're in a, in a kind of conflict situation,、um, your psychological juices are are are, are flowing even more strongly. You're, you know, you're really、uh, committed and invested in that in that conflict. And so.、Um, A, a lot of、uh, players project a lot onto the onto the AI because they feel this this competitive situation, and there's there's a number of different philosophies about AI,、um, and and you know, that, if my point of view is not necessarily the only point of view. There may be other other points of view, but I look at、um, AI as one element in creating an integrated、uh, overall experience for the player.、Um, In, in a in a single player game,、um, like most of the games we're talking about, the again the key the the star of the game the key experience is the experience that the player is 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 having,、um, and so A- AI is kind of a tool to to craft that experience to customize it to make it、uh, seem even more、uh, real to the player.、Um, there's another point of view which is that the AI should act like a another player another person should have humanish characteristics and should feel like another another player、um, I don't actually subscribe to that philosophy there's there's a couple things that that I've seen that that make me shy away from that I'm not saying it's、uh, absolutely the wrong idea but、um, in, in my experience、um, if an AI has human characteristics one thing we you know talk about is、um, I want it to surprise me. I want it to be tricky and clever.、Um, no, I don't. I don't think w- when AI does that, most players feel that、uh, it's it's being stupid. It's being、uh, it's it's dumb because there's a fine line between、uh, between clever and dumb, and the player is inclined to、uh, to see the AI as being dumb.、Um, if the if the player if the AI does something really brilliant, the player will assume that. The AI peeked behind the scenes and looked at my numbers and looked where, where my stuff was and and, and cheated basically.、Um, so there's a lot of kind of psychological、um, stuff that goes on、uh, if the AI acts in ways that are that are kind of out of out of the norm and and they generally、uh, lead to the player kind of jumping out, losing that suspension of disbelief and trying and kind of blaming the AI for for uh, uh, what's going on in the game. So. Um, in the, the way that I approach AI is to is to make it almost a、um, 
a metric, kind of a, a, a solid competition against which you play, but which you can uh, kind of feel and, and uh, your advancement as you, as you go on. You, you, you get this real sense of, of progress. There's this improvement metric that the, the AI is kind of predictable, kind of solid and steady, and, and you're the one doing the brilliant things and the clever things and, and, and getting better and better versus the, the AI. Another thing that AI can do is give you uh, feedback uh, when you're talking to the, the leaders in, in civilization. They often comment uh, upon what you're doing and how, you know, whether it's good or bad or whether they like it or don't like it. Um, when we're playing a, sil a single player game, uh, kind of feedback, um, validation is really important because you're kind of the only person there. And, and these AI characters are kind of your only friends at that point in time. So having them acknowledge what you're doing, be aware of it, is really validating for the player. And is uh, something we found in Civil Revol Revolution was really important, that, that the, more, the more that the other leaders in the game kind of reflected on what you were doing and, and reacted, the more the, the more the player felt that, that uh, somebody understood them, you know, kind of, oh, I, you, you know what I'm going through. And, and, and the, the, uh, they weren't just kind of playing in a vacuum, they were playing in a interesting uh, uh, world. Okay. <laughs> um, I talked a little bit earlier about self-destructive behavior. Um, ways that the player actually can, can damage their, their gameplay experience. Um, and one of the, the responsibilities that we think we, I think we have as designers is to protect the player uh, from themselves. And there are a couple ways where, places where this really becomes an issue. Um, one is how do you handle the idea of load and, and save? Um, I've watched people play Civilization where before every battle, they save the game. If they don't win, they reload that save game, play the battle again, save it until they win the game. To me, that's not really playing the game that I designed. That's not the experience uh, that, that, that I think is most interesting. It really doesn't require you to have a flexible strategy. It doesn't kind of require you to think, uh, think ahead. If you know you're going to win every battle, the game, I think, is a lot less fun. Um, so in Civilization Revolution, we actually save the random number um, with the save file, so that if you reload the save file, you get the same result in your battle. You know, ha, ha, ha. Well, that'll, you know, that'll teach you. Now, I guess people did find a way to get around that, but um, by providing the player perhaps too easy access to loading and saving, you, you may actually be diminishing the experience for the player, and that is something to think about in game design. Um, in, in Pirates, we actually only allow you to load and save the game when you're in a port. Um, as, you, as you voyage around, um, you need to live with the consequences of that, of that voyage. Um, and, and, by, and kind of by building it into the fantasy of the game, I think it's a little less obvious that we are trying to uh, kind of control your load-save behavior. But that's something to think about, is finding ways to, to build your load-save restrictions kind of into the, the fantasy, the story uh, of, of the game. Um, another um, area where I think we can, we can damage the, the gameplay experience for the player is in providing them too many options, settings, uh, things that they can kind of customize in the middle of the game. Uh, there's all sorts of good things that the player should be able to customize, you know, uh, whether you think the joystick works this way, whether you're left-handed or right-handed, you know, all those things are, are key. But there's been a, a, a tendency that I think has kind of gone away more recently, but to kind of open up uh, all sorts of gameplay decisions to the player. And to me, you know, that, that's, kind of, that's kind of wrong. We're, we're, as designers, we're here to make the game and, and not to kind of hand it over to the player and say, you know, well, I'm not sure how this game should work. You know, you, you figure it out. So kind of being careful with uh, the types of things that you open up to player uh, is, is, uh, is one thing to think about. Um, another is, is cheat codes. Again, it's, I think it's a way that players can, um, can actually uh, damage the, the gameplay experience for themselves. Um, I remember when uh, we were working on Civilization II, uh, I, I looked at, uh, Ryan Reynolds brought the, the game and I looked at it and there on the main menu was cheat. You know, it was like, play a quick game, play a random map, uh, play a game, cheat. And I said, you know, Brian, cheat. You know, on the main menu? He said, yeah, it's cool. You know, you can bring in tanks in the Middle Ages and run over people and, you know, people, it's cool. And, and I don't disagree that it's cool. 
In fact, I watched my, my son when he was playing, you know, have a wonderful time bringing in all these tanks and running roughshod over the, the, the pikemen in uh, the Middle Ages. But it's like, but Brian, you know, the main menu? Can't we just bury it one or two levels deeper? Because, you know, I, I kind of want the players to play the real game first before they start experimenting with the cheats and the, egg, the Easter eggs and things like that. So, um, um, the, the, good, the good news is that this, this cheating idea actually led directly to the idea of modding, uh, which is very powerful. Uh, certainly, uh, with Civilization II, it was, it was, a, it was a breakthrough for, for Civilization and, and added incredible amount of variety and energy to the Civilization series. This is a, a picture from uh, Fall from Heaven. Uh, and so, th there's, there's a happy ending to the story of, of, of cheats. Um, and, and, and modding has been a very cool, cool uh, addition, kind of allowing players to exercise their, uh, their inner designer and, and become part of the, the community process. So um, cheating, I'm not so sure, but modding is definitely a cool thing. Um, so another kind of psychological skill I think that we need to develop as designers is um, listening to the, to the player. Uh, I'm kind of assuming at this point that you've bought into the idea that uh, game design is an iterative process, you know, starting with a prototype and kind of building on that, uh, getting a lot of play, getting a lot of feedback, um, build, building a game over time. And if you do that, you're going to spend a lot of time talking to the players, the people that are playing your game, getting their feedback and, and taking advantage of that to make your game better. Um, but what I found in that process is that it's, it's, it's really not that useful to kind of uh, take literally what your players are saying to you. Um, there are um, different, different kind of ways that play, players will, will react to, to the game. Um, one is to kind of provide you with solutions. You know, uh, I think you should take this out. I think you should change this. Um, I think you know, this should work this way. Uh, some, occasionally that's useful, but a lot of times that really doesn't take into account um, other parts of the game that that would break, et cetera, et cetera. And it's tempting to kind of discard that, you know, that, that's not going to work. I know that's not going to work. You might have even tried that. Um, but I think it's important as a, as a designer to get, get some real value out of that, to drill down to what is motivating that solution. What is, what is wrong? What is, what is the kind of thing that the player is feeling or doing that is unsatisfying that leads them to, to kind of suggest the solution? And a lot of times, you can find something that uh, is consistent with, with your game design and your game ideas that will solve that problem for them. It might not be the exact solution that they propose, but it will solve the problem, and everybody, everybody's happy. Um, an, another type of um, comment that you might get back is, is kind of the, the opposite of that. It's, it's an emotion. You know? It doesn't feel right. It, I'm frustrated. I'm confused. I, you know, Again, no, very little information. And again, it's kind of our job as designers to figure out what is it, what is it that's causing that emotion? You know, what, what can I change um, to, to make that emotion go away if it's a bad emotion or, or to strengthen that if, it is a, um, if it's a positive emotion? Um, and the, another important, oops, don't look at that slide. Um, the last thing I think is important about talking to your players is, is knowing their individual personalities. Um, a lot of times that's very helpful in, in, in uh, deciphering, decoding what they're saying. Because a certain player you know, might not like that type of game and is never going to be happy. Uh, there, are, there are certain players we call uh, Mr. Anecdotal who will be convinced something has happened that you know is impossible, but we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll just kind of harp on that one thing that, that, that there are people that are very generous, you know, kind of afraid to say anything bad about the game. You almost have to force them. I know you hated something about it. Come, tell me. Tell me what it is. Um, so kind of knowing the personalities of uh, your players is, is important, in, again, in deciphering um, what, what they're really trying to tell you and uh, kind of really tapping into this resource, which is really invaluable, uh, the gameplay experience of, of your testers as you're playing the game. So what is the point of all this, you might be asking? Um, I'd kind of like to wrap it up with this idea of the epic journey. I think this is what we're trying to create for the player, is an epic journey. Uh, 
I think I should trademark this one too. Epic Journey. Keep that in. Um, you know, it, it, game, well, there's so many genres, so many styles of games, so many v different ways of gaming. But uh, I think, in a way, they, they can kind of all be encapsulated in this idea of an, an epic journey. And how do we use psychology to make our journey more epic and our epic more journey like? You might be asking. Um, here are a couple of tools um, that we have to make that happen. Um, I come back again and again to the idea of interesting decisions. Um, that's really the core, the, 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 the basic fundamental pieces of your game are these decisions that you're giving the player. And um, the, process, the, the journey is the process of exploring all these decisions and seeing how they relate to each other and, and, and playing through them. So um, th think about the decisions that you're giving your player. Um, are they ones that, that, that encourage them to project, to think into the future? You know, if I do this, what is going to happen? Do they have interesting um, kind of not taken paths? And the, the, most, the coolest decisions are the ones where the player chooses path A, but they're kind of saying, well, next time, you know, that path B looks kind of interesting too, so I'm going to play, I, I'm gonna play next time and try that other path. Those are the really powerful decisions. If you can, if you can build them into your game, you, you're, you're, you're uh, well on your way to creating the epic epic journey. Um, learning and progress. Um, this is fundamental to the journey. The idea that you are constantly progressing. You're constantly um, at a better place than you were before. You're smarter than you were before. You're more powerful. Um, it's kind of fundamental, but it's easy to lose track of this. I think the, you cannot uh, reward and acknowledge and, and, and reflect this progress too much in a game. It's very important for the player to know uh, how they're doing, uh, what progress, you know, what value has this last half hour, this last hour been to me in terms of, 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 of playing. Um, you know, I think World of Warcraft does a great job of this, you know, the, the level system is, you know, makes it very clear uh, the, the kind of progress you made and, and their, their ways of building this idea which is very powerful uh, into, into your game. One more turn. This is another way of, of making the journey epic. Um, it's a concept that, that we relate back to civilization, but it applies to almost every game. The idea that the player is constantly kind of leaning forward. They're anticipating things that are going to happen later. They've, they're, they're looking forward to their plans coming together. They're wondering what's around the next corner. Uh, you can foreshadow. You can, you can kind of uh, just let people know that cool stuff is going to happen soon. And it draws them very much into this um, one more turn phenomenon. And it, it kind of all comes back to this idea of, of replayability. That if you, if you create a, a, a fantastic journey um, and the player comes to the end of that journey, they suddenly realize that, that this is only one segment of this epic journey. This, this journey is much more epic than they even thought because it's only, this has only been a part. The epic was a part. It's like epic squared or epic cubed. Or, or multi, this journey is multi-epic. Um, and replayability kind of plants that seed and, 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 and makes that happen for your game. So these are some tools, some psychological tools that, uh, that, that make your game the coolest epic journey of all time. So now you know everything. Thank you.